Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's uh, virtual program. This is our, our second program today celebrating uh, NYC by Design Week. Uh, my name is uh, Andrew Gustafson and I'm from Turnstile Tours. Uh, and as people are continuing to join, we're just gonna go over a few uh, housekeeping things, um, how today's program is gonna work because we're gonna have presentations and we're also gonna have a live component uh, from the site, uh, from the um, future Made in New York campus uh, at the Bush Terminal. Um, a little bit about us at, at Turnstile Tours because I, I see we have some uh, uh, some new, new people here who haven't joined our programs in the past, but we're a, a tour company. We work in partnership with nonprofits and community organizations to uh, research and develop and operate uh, public programs, including uh, we work with the New York City Economic Development Corporation to run tours of the Brooklyn Army Terminal, uh, which is uh, right nearby where we're going to go today, uh, as well as the city's public markets. Uh, and so obviously we haven't given a whole lot of in-person guided tours over the last year. So we've had the opportunity to do hundreds of virtual programs. Uh, with our tour partners, as well as other organizations and scholars and experts and artists. Um, so you can check all that out on our website at turnstyletours.com. Um, for today, uh, how we are going to engage, uh, because we want to make this program as interactive as possible, is you can uh, drop uh, your questions and comments into the chat. Uh, and so we will incorporate them into our conversation uh, throughout. Uh, we also have have behind the scenes uh, my colleague uh, Stefan, uh, who will be answering questions um, in, in the, the chat and helping out with that. Um, and we also have closed captioning available. So if you would like to turn that on or off, uh, you can do that down uh, at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're on a mobile device um, or a tablet, you just go into the settings and you should be able to uh, adjust the um, closed captioning there. Um, we do have some other upcoming programs uh, as well uh, as we're continuing NYC by Design Week. So I'm just gonna share uh, a couple things uh, with you here for a moment. Um, so our next NYC by Design program is gonna be this Sunday. Where we're gonna go to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and we're going to explore a place called Bednark Studio, which is a design and fabrication studio. Uh, and we're gonna get a tour of their amazing facility and projects uh, with the owner and founder, uh, Michael Bednark. Um, we're also doing ongoing series of uh, virtual programs covering a wide variety of different topics. So if you wanna celebrate um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, we are doing a whole series about Thai food um, in the Northeast and we're highlighting different uh, Thai restaurants and distributors uh, and um, community organizations and, and uh, cultural events. Um, throughout New York City and, and beyond. Um, so we're doing that every Wednesday. Um, so you can check those out on our website. Um, we're continuing our series about um, of programs about the maritime industry and the New York City waterfront. So you can join our Connecticut River Canals program, uh, as well as our National Maritime Day uh, Trivia Night. Um, also, we are doing a limited number of in-person tours. So you can join us for our Prospect Park walking tours. Uh, coming soon, we'll be announcing the return of our Brooklyn Navy Yard bicycle tours, as well as walking tours of the Brooklyn Army Terminal. So you can sign up for our newsletter um, and, uh, and learn more there. Um, so uh, today's program, we have, like I said, a couple components. We're going to um, be talking with some of the um, people involved in this uh, project, but we're also uh, gonna be going live uh, out to the site, which we're gonna do in, in just a second. But I just wanted to um, mention who, who we have on today. So we're gonna be joined by Karina Gilbert from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Um, as well as uh, Mimi Huang from N Architects um, and David Ostrich from um, W Architecture and Landscape Architecture. Uh, and so they're going to be telling us about different aspects of the project, putting the project in context, um, but we'll also get to see what the project looks like uh, right now. So let's bring on Cindy here for a quick second, um, who's going to tell us uh, where, where she's at. Hi there. So, yeah, uh... so we can see you're at a construction site, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, I'm here at the Bush, Bush Terminal today, and I'm just going to flip my camera around so you guys can have a look. Um, we're standing here not far from uh, the entrance. Um, currently, if you were to come to the Bush Terminal, you could enter here at uh, 43rd and 1st. Um, and just behind me here, we have, we have a bunch of folks that are 
uh, coming in, coming in the gate and making their way uh, to Bush Terminal Park. Um, but straight across from me here, you can see Irving T. Bush, uh, uh, who we're going to learn about a little bit later during the program. Yeah, and so this area you're in right now, Cindy, this is all a, a public area, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So this here, um, if you, you enter um, back where I showed you a little bit earlier, 43rd and 1st, you just walk in here past this building. And then just to my left, uh, we can see folks moving in this direction. But this is the entrance to Bush Terminal Park, um, which yeah. is a, a wonderful kind of relaxing place. A lot of people have spent time here, especially during the pandemic. We're so grateful for all the parks um, yeah. in the city. But behind mm -hmm. you, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to uh, walk through the construction site in, in just a minute. And what we're going to talk about is not only the, the Made in New York campus um, that's creating facilities for um, the fashion industry and manufacturing, but we're also um, going to talk about the, uh, the new public realm uh, and publicly accessible areas that are going to be opened up uh, on this north side of the campus. Um, so thanks for that look in. And we'll be cutting back and forth to Cindy throughout the program today um, so we can see it, see it live. Um, but I want to um, introduce um, our first guest, uh, who's going to be kind of setting the stage and giving us uh, the context about um, Sunset Park and the Bush Terminal. So I want to welcome on uh, Karina Gilbert from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Cindy. Um, yeah. Do you have slides that are going? Yeah, up? I'll pull up your slides in a second. But can you Great. just uh, introduce yourself yes. and tell us a little bit about your, your role yeah, uh, at um, NEC? Yeah. So I'm Karina Gilbert. I'm the Senior Vice President at EDC, directing the Design and Construction Team in the Asset Management Division, and I'm also an architect. So it's a keen interest in this project for many reasons. Great. So I'm going to pull up your slides right here. Can you see those okay? Yeah, great. Um, so I think before we jump into the Made in New York campus project, or as we like to call it, MINI, I'd like to share why this project is so important for us at EDC and for the community and the city. Um, so at EDC, uh, our mission is to create good jobs and strengthen neighborhoods. We manage over 220 properties in the city, 65 million square feet. And with that, there's a lot of opportunity and responsibility to impact the communities that we're in. Um, in Sunset Park alone, we have four campuses, which amounts to 6 million square feet of existing industrial space uh, and a lot of land around that. Um, and one of those is Bush Terminal. So this helps you situate the project as it relates to the larger Sunset Park um, area. You can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so we're a mission-driven property owner, which means we're, we're principled. We, we manage all of our industrial properties to maximize jobs in the industrial sector, create opportunities for businesses to grow, and provide amenities to support them, um, which includes connections to transportation, parking, events and programming, uh, and as Andrew and Cindy mentioned before, a real keen eye towards public open space and placemaking. Um, next slide, please. So we want these campuses and spaces to be a great public asset for, for many reasons, and both creating good jobs and as neighborhood amenities. They're city properties, so opening them up to the public, as challenging as that is, because they're also industrial campuses and historically not so pedestrian friendly. Um, so it's a, an effort that we take seriously. And we're excited about some of the success that we've had so far uh, at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, just down the street from Bush, um, where we've made improvements in the past few years and have seen how great it feels to activate these new public spaces with people. And that's what all these images are from, right? From the, yes. th that sort of esplanade that comes down uh, 58th Street. Yep, near the new ferry, ferry landing. Next slide, please. Um, so Bush Terminal, like much of the Sunset Park waterfront is an old industrial campus. It's part of the historic shipping complex um, that modern day Industry City was also born out of. Uh, it's over 100 years old, hasn't seen much attention in the past several decades, and was really a ripe opportunity for the city to focus on investment. Um, in 2017, if we all remember back that far, uh, the mayor announced the Made in New York campus and that it would co-locate much needed garment manufacturing, as well as spaces for film and media, uh, other spaces for light manufacturing and public realm improvements. Um, and I think specific to garment manufacturing, we've all seen a decline in the industry as rents um, have escalated in the city. 
but it's still incredibly important in New York City's fashion value chain. So there's a real need to continue supporting those businesses. Um, and what the team will walk through uh, with you all shortly is that Mini North with um, the area that's highlighted in blue with its existing building stock uh, and scale was really a great location and choice for this opportunity. Um, so the charge that we had for the team uh, is how do you reconceive a historic industrial campus and its old bones to answer the questions of today? How do you create a campus to support modern garment industry uh, and the needs for the community and the neighborhood? So I'll let Mimi take it from there. Great, yeah, th thank you so much. Um, and I'll pull this down here. Um, thank you so much, I, that was really great for kind of setting the, the context of, of where we're gonna be and, and what this project is, is all about. Um, and Mimi is gonna um, help us with uh, a, a few different uh, aspects of it. And first we're gonna uh, set that historical context um, and kind of the site that they, they were working with. So uh, I wanna invite on Mimi Huang, um, from uh, an architects. Hi, how are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Mimi Huang. I'm one of the co-founding partners of an architects. And we have been working on this project with our associate architect Perkins Eastman, and over a dozen uh, engineers, um, namely Arab Silman Langen, Vidaris. Um, and it's a real honor to work on this project because I really am very, very interested in the larger goals um, of the Made in New York initiative of retaining manufacturing in the city and retaining um, their, their workspace and supporting workers. So I wanted to start with the history of Bush Terminal because it's really interesting and it is very much tied with what we can do um, in terms of the renovation of the buildings. So Andrew, you want to pull up the slides or did you want to go back to Cindy? Okay, uh, so Bush Terminal um, was built between 1905 and 1925. Uh, this is one of the historic maps. At the time that it was built, it was revolutionary. It was the largest intermodal shipping, storing and distribution network. And it was the first of its kind in terms of really integrating all manner of shipping and distribution, namely ships and the rail the railways. So here we are on the Bush, uh, uh, on the Brooklyn waterfront. Next. And here's an aerial of it. Um, building A and C are the buildings that we are renovating um, to um, welcome garment manufacturers. Um, next. And you can see in these historic aerials how um, the buildings, you know, were really very much storehouse. Uh, warehouse buildings, not really for workspace, um, and very much about bringing goods off of ships next into the buildings. Uh, this is an actual photograph of building A. Um, and you can see in this photo that it was really a building of all doors, no windows, no glass. The, the goods were brought off the ships, um, carried via these dollies um, and, and wagons, and then craned up straight into the building, and then out next to the other side, um, which is the city side. Next. Maybe this is maybe this is a good opportunity. We can we can just take a peek in with Cindy, so that yeah, sure. folks can see what the building looks like today. Yeah. And if so this is literally building A facing the waterfront. And we can see uh, if you turn to your right a little bit, Cindy. We can also see those those kind of um, the rounded doors on the the you know those those bays. Yeah, in the, yeah the the arched um, uh, doors, which you know, right now we're looking at Building C, the the one next to it, but Building A looked exactly identical, which you can see on the photo. But you know, it's been renovated. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide. So really, Great, you know, you, the the goods came 
in off of the water and um, this is east of those buildings um, straight onto these railway cars um, and so it's really interesting to think about the buildings as this the node between water and city we want to bring this connection back from the city to the water and vice versa next what happened to bush terminal was that the airplane was invented and freight was invented, air freight. And so from, you know, about 1930, it, um, uh, a little bit after next, the buildings, um, the Bush terminal was abandoned. Um, the, the port, the main port moved from Brooklyn to New Jersey. Um, and you can see here that those buildings started to literally disappear and disintegrate into the water. Next. And so what used to be a very, very, you know, um, dense waterfront full of storehouses and warehouses um, became what we now see it as this um, previously industrial area with um, an incredible opportunity to reconnect the city um, to the east with the waterfront to the west and next. Um, with with contemporary uh, issues, which is that, you know, previously no one went to this waterfront unless you were working here. It was very much a working class waterfront. Now we have the pressure of public space. As much as we need manufacturing space, we need public space. And so our one of our goals is to, you know, do all of the above, to retain the industrial use, but to also open up um, and invite the public to uh, that waterfront. And with that, I wanna turn it over to David. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the, the, the description of the site. I think it captures the essence very well. And I think our job really has been how to integrate. This is a totally, this is very much a unique situation of industry and public space combined. Uh, one of the aspects of this project, as we'll see, is there's not going to be fences around these buildings. This is all going to be open to the public and be accessible to the public. And how we create environments that sort of define where industry is happening and where the public realm is happening. Uh, we'll talk about that next. Next slide. This image here is uh, right at the joint between the entrance to the Brooklyn Park Terminal, the, the Brooklyn uh, Waterfront Park. Uh, Cindy showed it to you, there's an arch. We very much wanted to make this, this is a waterfront, and this is one of the few waterfront spaces that are accessible in the Sunset Park neighborhood. So we wanted to make it a place where families from can come uh, during the day, weekends, have a place to gather, play, uh, enjoy, where the people who are working in the tech, in the buildings can come out and enjoy their lunch times. That. So there's a lots of variety of spaces. This shows a, a lawn area where we for play. We also wanted to remember the history and you'll see how we've uh, sort of encapsulated the history. As Mimi said, this was not about manufacturing as much about storage and moving. And one of those elements of storage and moving that we sort of picked up on is the iconic pallet and the pallet being that which uh, goods are stacked on and moved by. And we created seating elements, as you can see in this perspective, that are uh, reminiscent of pallets. They're stacked somewhat casually to create seating platforms for people to gather on. Uh, uh, and David, if I could just uh, um, take a moment to, to orient people, sort of what we're looking at and what we're seeing from Cindy's perspective. Um, so that this, this building right here in the center, um, this is where Cindy started. So Bush, the this Bush is statue is, is right over here. Yes, this uh, is the administrative building yep. with the Bush statue in front. So this is 43rd Street right here. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Next. Next slide, please. Uh, along with play areas, we're uh, designing an interactive fountain uh, because water, we are on the water and water is something that always attracts people and children. But we wanted to, as you can see, it's very much about pipes and things and stacking. Uh, we took the idea of conduit and uh, 
duck banks and could we take this module of duck banks stack it and then play with how water comes out of it from spray of steam to jets and moving around and actually as uh, Andrew mentioned this is the front of the uh, Bush Terminal Administration building that's the statue of Mr. Bush so this area in that space becomes a ver very much a cafe seating area with lots of plantings and a unique fountain to the site next yes and Cindy is pretty very close to right where that's going to be she's looking at yes also we wanted to provide access to water this is moving along uh, to uh, building C you see the the arched windows in the background uh, more the stacked pallet benches up here, but we also created an area of steps to the water so that you can walk down, sit, and get close to the water and, and actually bring the nature that has occupied the space right now up into the plaza area so you can be close to both the water and the planting and providing places to gather. But it, you, as you can see in these effects, the general feeling is still maintaining an openness because uh, this is uh, you know there is industry going in here people will be moving uh materials around and hopefully it is a mixture of both public and the sort of industrial activity you can see in the background of this perspective the loading docks for building a and building c but there still is a walkway along the edge to connect around next this is the view from 43rd street it's a very important view uh, it's uh, we've maintained it in an open way to always to 43rd Street used to go essentially almost between these two white lines here, but we've uh, closed it. So we've removed vehicles from uh, this area, which is, will make a, a massive change so that the sides of these buildings will become an all a public space rather than a vehicular space that it is now. And we've done that. To do that and so hopefully this is the view maintaining the views out towards the water and that, that view that always has been there will be maintained from first avenue so if you look down first avenue there will always be at this long view of water lined by trees and the buildings to the side uh, yes. and we had a question uh, what what will be the uh vehicular uh and delivery entrance for the campus well we've done something to minimize pedestrian and vehicular conflicts the, entry, the vehicular entry will be on 41st Street. That will be to, the vehicular services for the buildings will enter on 41st Street and make a one-way loop out exiting on 42nd Street. Uh, private vehicles, there's a parking lot there now behind the cafe and admin building that will be maintained and expanded. And that will be accessed uh, through a shared street on 43rd, but you won't be allowed to drive to the end. Great, thank you. Next. Uh, this is a view down what we call mini lane. Uh, this is the space between building A and the building B to the left. That's uh, will be a part of another project. We wanted to maintain, great, this is, it, it's very much a tighter, more intimate space uh, from the sort of larger openness of the terminal plaza. This is an area where we've worked uh, hard to preserve the initial, the existing character of the site, which is the uh, granite pavers or rail lines, that industrial nature. So we will be maintaining the pavers and the rails, resetting them, integrating lights and the pallet benches. And also with, in between the rails, we've carved out planting areas to create a, so much a, a wild garden along this area to provide places to sit and gather and, and enjoy the environment between the buildings. Next. Next. Uh, Mimi. Thanks, David. Yeah, so um, that that space was Mini Lane, which is the east facade and the front entrance to Building A. Um, the entire campus is actually on the State Historic 
registry, which means that um, a lot of our work uh, in the beginning was, um, you know, kind of communication, collaboration with uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, um, and to acknowledge that history is not dead, it's still alive, there are many layers of history that we should be revealing um, rather than erasing. So this is the original facade of building A, next, and, and um, uh, sometime in the 50s, it's hard to pin it down, um, they removed those arch windows and started to cut these um, long slots next into the facade um, to introduce the new windows and to introduce these concrete spandrels that you see in between the floors. This is maybe 1950 something, which means that it's one of the first uses of concrete um, in, in this way. So again, it was quite revolutionary. Next. But this is the building that we inherited, totally painted over with um, the pale yellow uh, brick coating, um, all of the openings on the, almost all of them on the ground floor, completely boarded up. Um, and this is our challenge. How do we make manufacturing work visible to the public? How do we help manufacturers um, attract a business, bring their work product down to the street um, without um, but in a different way, let, let's say it this way, this is not the laptop crowd, right? This is really for light manufacturing. So um, we were very careful to not make it too nice, not make it too polished, um, to retain some of the, some of the grit um, and the industrial character of the historic site. Next. And so our proposal was to um, create you know, a, a more obvious entrance, a double height space that would really help to bring the good down, goods down to the street. Next, to um, peel away that paint, but not all of it. So it's going to be a little bit imperfect um, to, uh, you know, do a kind of a new version of the concrete spandrels, um, this time with ultra high performance concrete panels on the ground floor, which will have a kind of ripply texture that is a little bit fabric like. Um, and then to next, um, to create this uh, um, more obvious kind of uh, presence at a very important intersection. So we were just looking at David's public realm um, image, which is that, uh, which is, you know, a zoom in uh, of the same area, mini lane um, behind us is building C. And so this um, will be hopefully the catalyst for more uh, manufacturing spaces um, to be renovated in the surrounding buildings. Next. And so this is that east facade again. And now we're going to finally go inside. So this is the main entry and what you will pass next. Um, in the main, oh, I forgot about this is, um, uh, th this is for architecture nerds. This is a worm's eye axonometric. So pretend you're a worm and you are looking from below so that um, we can explain to you how we are cutting this, what we call an interior public street from mini lane straight out to the waterfront uh, and to really try to connect always city to water. Next. And so this is the lobby space. Um, inside, we are, you know, in bits and pieces, trying to keep um, as much as possible. Um, we are keeping the entire superstructure of the building, which are these beautiful mass timber girders, beams, columns. Um, we are, you know, uh, wherever possible, keeping those on the ground floor. We are revealing um, all of those floor joists above because they're quite striking, um, and really you know again emphasizing that connection to back to the water that reception desk is a miniature of the sun of sunset park uh, waterfront so it's a kind of mini me of uh, where you are um, with a with a fake street lamp uh, as the reception desk lamp next so in this uh, main space, it's meant to be extremely flexible um, for events um, that hopefully will really galvanize the community of manufacturers. Um, and it's not just the manufacturers, you know, the fashion industry, there's a huge ecosystem um, of um, 
all, all sorts of different people, um, which is part of the reason why it worked so well in Manhattan. All of the designers, the buyers, the cut and sew people, the dye houses, the distributors, the sellers, everybody is in that district. Um, and so the goal is to, um, to, to support a similar ecosystem here on the Brooklyn waterfront. Next. Uh, if I could just add, add one thing on that point, um, which is that you, you also did a, a lot of uh, research because this, the, the, we already have a lot of this industry in the neighborhood of Sunset Park, right? Yes, they were already there. It's true. Um, yeah, that's the that's another aspect, a kind of more recent aspect of um, the demographic of Sunset Park. Um, thanks for prodding me, Andrew. Um, is that, you know, as rents were rising in Chinatown, a lot of the Chinese community moved to Sunset Park, the, the older generation of Chinese immigrants. Um, and it's really, you know, important to, you know, really acknowledge who, who is in this neighborhood because they are the ones who have the cut and sew skills. Um, and that is the Latino immigrants and the Asian immigrants. Um, it's it's um, a skill that is not necessarily being taught in fashion schools. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on the kind of um, creating of a brand and creating of a business, but there aren't many fashion schools that simply teach people how to sew. And so that aspect is really interesting to think about, you know, that, you know, we have to kind of support not just the jobs, but the training. Um, and so that can you if you can go to the next slide, um, which is the same space, but now you're on the second floor looking down. And the idea of some of the second floor spaces is to partner um, with maybe uh, a fashion school or, you know, other nonprofits that um, would provide some educational aspects um, or research, resource sharing um, so that, you know, skills can, can be learned. Um, but the idea is that, you know, that middle space that we um, visualize as a fashion show or in, in this uh, scene as a kind of open gallery space is meant to coalesce people, to bring them out of their workspaces and down to the first two floors. And, and does this double height space go the, the length of the building? It, um, the, the interior street goes the length of the building, but the double height space is right in the middle where okay. it, where it is the darkest. So, so maybe we can, um, we can take a look at what, what Cindy's seeing, because Cindy is on the mini lane, which is sort of this new street, right? That's that the project is creating. Um, so Cindy, if, if you're with us, I'm going to spotlight you. So, so Mimi. Um, yeah, so you can see it's it, this is it's a pretty ex extensive renovation of this building, right? <laughs> it, it's uh, walking. We, I had the opportunity to walk around the site the other day with, with Cindy as well, and it's yeah, it's 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 enormous. Um, yeah. But so what you're looking at is that corner shot that we showed you before, right? Um, and what hasn't happened yet, but will very, very soon is the stripping of that brick down to the original brick. And then later those cuts, you know, in that sequence of slides that we were showing you, you know, slowly stepping up to that double height space, which is right underneath the, that bridge. If you can pan to your right, Cindy that bridge yeah so to the left of that bridge is where that double height space where where the main entrance will be and you can also see now um uh those rail lines that david was talking about um that you know will be revealed and um with planting in between um and so remind people again the building that's to their to our right right now that's building b that's that's not part of the project, right? So that's a that's a future project, and this building has tenants in it, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Building A does not mm -hmm. right now, so it's easier to to renovate. 
And and just so people are, are aware, Mini Lane is M I N Y, as in made in New York, right? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't actually a map street. It didn't have a name, so the team just came up with the name. <laughs> so nobody know nobody knows about that name except for us. But I think we need to uh, apply for a street name or something. <laughs> yeah, and and it also extends behind Cindy as well. So maybe Cindy, you can turn around 180 degrees. Sure. And so will this public realm um, that David was discussing, will that extend um, down this street, section of the street as well? Yes. yes. Great. All right, Thank, thanks for showing that to us, Cindy. And, and we're gonna come back to Cindy in a, in a few minutes where she'll show us sort of the, the opposite corner um, of, of the building, sort of the, the far north end of the campus. But uh, we, can, we can dive back into the slides. Okay. Yeah, so you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, this is the last interior slide. Um, this is again, the, the, you know, a typical workspace and um, the existing columns, existing structure, um, you know, we are, we are, you know, not covering a lot, really. We're, we're just trying to reveal different layers of history and, of course, improve things that we need to improve. All new windows, all new floors, new ceilings, etc. But, you know, trying to reveal the historic aspect wherever we can. And um, the, you know, the existing bays were Work very well with how cut and sew manufacturers work. They have these super long tables um, where they just roll out, you know, kilometers of fabric um, and um, and and other stations for dyeing or you know hope there, there's some um, specialty um, textile people who print on textiles also um, so it's been really really interesting um, you know to kind of really understand the the whole ecosystem um, and the beginning of the project we went with the EDC to visit um, some potential future tenant spaces to understand how they work, um, to understand who they are, um, wh where their workforce is coming from, um, to really try to support them. And um, we can maybe go to the last slide. And it's also really interesting to understand that, you know, it's it's um it's not a black and white issue you know we cannot simply reveal you know everything that everybody is doing because there are a lot of trade secrets um and so at the same time that we're trying to create a community you know um everybody needs their own space and and um some you know there are some aspects of their trade that are secret like certain patterns or certain textile uh designs or you know, or who their buyer is, et cetera. So um, the upper floors are those workspaces for the tenants. The first two floors are meant to be more public um, for things like the fashion show or um, uh, pop-up exhibitions or um, pop-up training sessions, um, things like that. But really the hope is to really try to um, support them with, um, you know, affordable rent and more visibility um, and to, you know, raise the public's awareness of this work that we shouldn't, you know, simply outsource to, um, and effectively when we outsource, we outsource our labor issues and our environmental crimes uh, because we don't know what, what's happening, right? Um, but, you know, also to support um, communities of, uh, um, of color um, because these, these are the people who are working here. Um, and so on this section, you see the city on the left, the waterfront on the right. And um, with that, I think we should turn it back to Cindy and we can also uh, go to our 3D model um, to field questions. Yeah, and, and we did have one question what, since we're talking about the garment industry. Um, and the question was about if the, the, um, in, the, in developing this project, uh, you considered um, issues about uh, 
dealing with wastes and chemical wastes um, from the, the fashion industry. Um, this may be, uh, be beyond the scope of the project, but, but someone had a question about it. Um, and what, if any consideration was made for that in the, in the, um, in the scope? Yeah, I, you know, the, because of the kinds of businesses that are left in New York, um, generally the people who are here are the cut and sew people. The chemical waste is in the textile creation and the dye houses, et cetera. And generally they are not here because those operations have moved a long time ago overseas and to places like LA where there's more mm -hmm. land. Um, so we did not really deal with that here, um, but also we are in a floodplain. And so we did not want to uh, encourage dye houses, which are um, very, very water intensive, et cetera. So it wasn't something that we had to deal with here. And then I think, you know, because this is, you know, geared towards who, you know, people who can still be in New York. So therefore, the production run is a little bit smaller. Um, and, you know, many of them do have um, kind of more sustainable techniques. Um, for, for example, printing on textiles is now done with an inkjet printer. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for the, for the question, Sean. I uh, hope that answers it. Um, he mentioned that uh, if this was an issue I had to contend with, that phytoremediation is a uh, way to, to deal with it. But let's take let's take a look at at Cindy. Um, and so she is now on the extreme north end um, of the campus. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm I'm here. You can see Building A should be recognizable to everyone. Um, and then in the distance, uh, just to the right of Building A, we can see. Building C, uh, and then of course we have, uh, it's a beautiful day to be out here, but the waterfront uh, looking out this way, just to give everyone a little bit of context in terms of where I am. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so so uh -huh. here we can also see, um, if you turn around again, Cindy, uh, we can see uh, piers um, five and, and six. Um, and that was also outside of the scope of this project. Is that right? Yes, mm -hmm. future phase. Yeah, um, great. And, and so if we turn 180 degrees around again, Cindy, uh, we can see that there's this building um, that, that's called the Annex, right? So this was an, an addition that was, that was put on to, to building A. Um, and we can step inside because I think it's, it's a really, really grand and amazing space. Yeah, this was added to the original building we're not really sure, probably somewhere between the late 30s and 50s. So this uh, will be a future tenant. It's a fantastic space. What a great view. Um, and so this is a, about the height, right? That that center uh, um, space in uh, building A will have, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you and you can see that. some of those original joists that mm -hmm. Cindy was just showing, right? We couldn't do it everywhere because, you know, as soon as you remove the jip that is covering the ceilings, you change the fire rating of the floor assembly. So um, when we remove it, we have to um, use this expensive paint to coat that wood. So we couldn't do it everywhere. Uh, and is that the case? Because we, we could see in the renderings a lot of the, um, uh, you know, exposed uh, wooden posts in, in, in the interior spaces as well. Yeah, the, the paint is on the joists, the, the floor, the floor joists above. Okay. Yeah. Great. This is a great view. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Cindy. Um, we did have uh, another question from the audience and um, John was just asking if we could um, just give people, again, a, a quick overview of um, what the project encompasses. So I'm just going to pull up the map, um, again, that, that Karina showed at the beginning. So we can see it here. So we're talking about these two buildings right here, A and C. And then the, the public space on the, on the, uh, east, the west and, and east sides of the buildings, right? Yes, west is up. Yeah, west is up. Yes, thank you. <laughs> east, east is the mini lane. Mm -hmm. Right here. 
and then all, all the streets that lead to it. So 40, 43rd is the main one. That, that so was that's the one. 43rd yeah, right here. The, yeah, the view that David talked about, um, keeping clear to the waterfront. Yeah. Great. Um, and for in 42nd right here. Um, all right, fan, fantastic. So you mentioned, um, Mimi, that you do have a, uh, a 3D rendering um, that will let us, Cindy can't go inside, obviously, even though she has a hard hat on, um, it's, uh, can't go inside. So why don't we, um, why don't we take a look at that? Uh, I know Paul is gonna help us with that. Mm -hmm. Should I share my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think we can just have it as people ask questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what, what space are we in right now? We just walked in the front door. That's the reception desk, the Sunset Park waterfront uh, outline. <laughs> and straight ahead is Pier 5 and 6. Okay, so we're coming so, in from the, from the mini lane side. Yeah, we just came in from the mini lane side. And then Paul, if you can walk west a bit, we've set up the fashion show. Um, but if you also, you know, you can just scoot over to kind of give a sense of that double height space, which um, you can maybe climb up the stairs. I don't know. <laughs> this is like a verbal video game. <laughs> And we could have done this on, on Twitch. <laughs> Great. And Cindy's going to uh, walk a little bit further down building A. and um, So this is the second can, floor. And um, there's kind of bleacher-like seating looking uh, over that double height space onto whatever event is happening. And this is very much how Great. we and design. If, if folks are. Uh... Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to say, if folks um, are uh, di didn't realize this in Zoom, but if you're on a, a computer, you can actually slide um, the divider between the screen that you're seeing, the view from Cindy, and the the rendering, so you can pull them up side by side. So the rendering, we're now on the second floor and, and Cindy is uh, looking in from the first floor. Yes, and just to clarify, I'm on the, this, the waterfront side. So this is where yeah. we can actually take a peek in. Cool. Thank, thanks so much uh, for, for that view. Um, are there any other uh, places you wanna show us uh, on, the, on the inside? Um, Paul or, or Mimi <laughs> in the rendering. Yeah, that's great, Paul. I mean, the other space is, you know, the our, our scope is really the core and shell. So, you know, when the tenants come in, they will be fitting out their spaces. So um, the main interior work that we did was on the first and second floor. Otherwise, the tenants, tenant spaces will be, you know, um, white, uh, white, it's, it's called white box uh, level. But this wall that is to the right, that is basically on the other side of the annex that you just saw. Got you, okay. And now we're looking straight out at the waterfront. And for those of you who are not architects who are interested, you know, th this is how we work. We put everything in this 3D model, including all of the ducts, the lights, et cetera, sprinklers, try to resolve conflict. Um, Pre-COVID, this would be on a VR headset uh, so that the client can um, kind of stand in uh, spaces and get a very, very good kind of sense of the scale of the space. So now we're, um, yeah, on the waterfront side, looking back. Great, so we, we had a couple questions here um, and we can open it up to, uh, to all of our panelists. Um, but uh, 
we had a question um, if if anyone could could share uh, any more detail about future plans for buildings B and D, um, the powerhouse, the roundhouse, or piers six and seven. Karina, you want to take this? Yes. Um, uh, there, there will be future plans um, as our, our team evaluates the need and additional um, funds um, and investment opportunities to put to them. Um, we've got some ideas, but they're they're not fully baked and, and aren't fully public yet. So we will um, we will leave us all in suspense for now. But our, our focus lately has been on the mini campus for these mm -hmm. these um, renovations and and site. So that we're, that we're doing now and next phase will be will be those exact buildings that you're asking about um and dan asks uh is is there any incorporation of solar or other green energy um uh into uh into these these buildings uh a and c dan i wish there was there there isn't um there's um several reasons for this um it's a historic structure, and so it was not a requirement. Um, but the bigger reason is that this is in a floodplain, and um, the the design flood elevation, which means the elevation to which up to which you need to protect the building and harden the building, is about where that paint line is. Um, so that means that on the ground floor, the entire perimeter of both buildings need to be hardened. So we have to pour a concrete wall behind the entire facade, um, pour an entirely new slab and connect the, the wall to the slab and, and do a lot of flood proofing um, and flood mitigation. So that's a lot of costs that, you know, you never really see <laughs> because it's, it's not in the finishes really, it's, it's in everything that you don't really see. And so, um, it was, uh, you know, there's just a kind of budget limit. Um, that is the main environmental protection that we had to, um, take care of. Great. That's, that's super, super, uh, helpful to, to understand. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. So um, we can we can pull down the rendering and maybe we can take a, a look at uh, more of what Cindy is is seeing here, um, get a closer look um, at some of the facades. I, I had a question which was um, if, uh, you know, were there any, you know, particularly interesting or surprising historical details of the building that you um, you know, it chose to incorporate uh, into the design or were inspirations for, for the design? Yeah, you know, we did a lot of sleuthing around, you know, we, when we visited, you know, and visually looked at the buildings, we just thought, oh, they're two different buildings. But when we dug into the deep, deep archives and understood that those two buildings were exactly the same, you know, just kind of uncovering that and, and, and then also uncovering an, a certain um, bay that we think was a double height bay, put, potentially to bring in larger vehicles straight through, you know, th th those details are, are fascinating. Those stars that you see uh, was was something that I didn't know about. Those stars are um, the, the tie-ins, um, the, the um, what, what basically, you know, it's like a big, big, big bolt <laughs> that attaches the facade through to the um, floor girders that are behind. So if anybody's ever wondered, you see buildings like this all yeah. over the place. Don't, these, don't remove those. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They hold the building together. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dan also had a question, which was, um, is that the flood, flood proofing you, you described, is that uh, dry flood proofing or wet flood proofing? Dan, you are an architect, I can tell. Um, it's dry flood proofing. Uh, so for those of you who might not know the difference, wet flood proofing means that you simply let the water come in and then you uh, install what are called flood vents that allow the water to 
um, escape after the flood event. Um, that is very, very tricky because, you know, that might be okay for storage. That is not okay for your elevator banks. That is not okay for, you know, a kitchen if you want to bring in a cafe, et cetera. So um, the EDC decided that, uh, you know, it was not ideal for ground floor tenants to allow it to be wet flood proofing. It is much less expensive, the, the wet flood proofing. But you are left with a lot to clean up afterwards after the uh, water escapes and also because we had to put some utilities uh, uh, rooms on the ground floor so it's dry. Hmm. Um, and were, were there tenants like on the first floor of this building during Hurricane Sandy? Were... Say that again Andrew? Oh, uh, were there, do you know if, were there tenants on the first floor of this building during Hurricane Sandy that were, were impacted? I don't know. Maybe the EDC knows. Um, and yeah, that was before my time, so I can't actually speak to that. Um, but we do know, again, I, I think we can and see it well here. So as, as you described, Mimi, that the, that the, the, the flood level um, is about where that, that brown paint ends. Is that right? On these posts? Yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, Cindy, how, how high is that in relation to, to you? Is that about, is that above your head? Yes, it is above my head, actually. So it's, it's yeah. with, with the floor, it's above your head because they just removed that entire floor. So <laughs> the floor is actually at the top of those footings. So it's about five feet from the floor on, on this side. Yeah. So oh, that's right about your perfect. eye level, Cindy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, we also had a question here, which was, um, do you have any idea why building A was, was modified to make it, you know, look so radically different from, from building C? That is a million dollar question. <laughs> we always wondered that, you know, I, I kind of suspect that um, it was a lot less expensive to replace uh, you know, to, to install rectangular windows, then replace those arched windows. Um, may, and, and, you know, the, the cuts that they did, basically they cut from the fourth floor down to the second floor, one big cut. Mm -hmm. And then in between, if you, if Cindy, you can show the facade, the, um, the second floor so that sure. you can see, yeah, so you see those concrete spandrels, right? So yeah. they, so you see those cuts really well. If if you can show all the way up to the fourth or fifth floor, so they, you know this is super efficient, right? They just made a cut from the from the fifth floor down to the second floor, and then infilled. So I I suspect efficiency. Um, maybe those arch windows were failing, mm -hmm. and this was you know, a much easier way to do it. You know, this is one of the first, you know, uses of concrete, right? Maybe somebody whispered, you know, there's a, there's a cheaper way to do this. We don't know. It's interesting because the program we did this morning uh, about building 127 at the, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, there was a lot of conversation about the challenges of uh, replacing, finding replacements for the historic windows of, of the building in part because of their size and their odd shape. So yeah, it could, that, that makes a lot of sense that uh, it was cheaper if it, to make these standard, you know, rectangular holes rather than dealing with all those arch bays. Um, well, great. Well, thank you uh, so much, everybody, for, for all of your questions. Um, we're just about out of time, um, but I want to give a big thanks to all of our incredible guests. Um, we had, uh, I, I learned so much about this project, um, and thank you um, to, uh, to Mimi and to David and Karina, and also to Paul and uh, Stefan uh, and Cindy on site uh, for, for helping make this program possible. Um, yeah, any, any last words that anybody would like, like to share before we go? I, when I, wanted, I actually forgot to thank our team that we're working with is uh, Dewberry Engineers is leading our, our site work team to provide the engineering and design uh, structural services for us. And also Domingo Gonzalez Lighting Associates is providing lighting for the site work. Great. 
Yeah, Mimi, anything you'd, you'd like to add? Just thanking the EDC for trusting us. <laughs> Because it's a it's a really major project, and um, I have learned a lot about uh, just the broader issues of work and gentrification, and you know manufacturing, and you know the, the larger economic um, picture. And it's um, it's super fun to be involved with that as an architect. Yes, I think it's a, it's a very challenging project because the fact that we're combining industry and the public and there's not fences it's it's all open and i think it'll be a typology that a lot of people will look at in the future um and i think we also want to give thanks to uh gilbane who is doing the construction on this site but they were also very accommodating to let us you know wander around for the the site for a couple days so we could make this uh this virtual experience possible yeah, I'd just like to thank Mark so, Rosenzweig for uh, basically being my partner in crime on the ground um, and making <laughs> sure that we could visually access the site in a safe way today. So thank, thank you, Mark. No problem, <laughs> yeah. And maybe we can see you say goodbye formally, Cindy. You want to flip your camera around? All right. So, so thank you all so much, everybody. Um, join us for our next uh, NYC by Design program, which is going to be on Sunday. We're going to visit Bednark Studio uh, at two o'clock um, and uh, stay tuned for future virtual programs and, and in-person tours. Again, thank you so much to our guests and our, our wonderful audience and your great questions. Uh, and we will see you on I Sunday. Did, Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.